This is Force for Hire. A deep dive into private military contracting and how it's transforming the battlefield. I'm Michelle Harvin. And I'm Desmond Ferris. Johan Roth has been in the business for a while. He started in the South African National Defense Force when he was just 17 and left military contracting just two years ago at age 50. He's done pretty much everything from escorting military convoys to VIP protection to maritime work. And he was among the many joining the efforts to rebuild Iraq after the 2003 invasion. Johan has been tested along the way with ambushes and even getting locked up by Iraqi officials, which is definitely a story you'll want to stick around to hear. He also wrote a book about his experience called Blood Money, which was the first eyewitness account written by a South African contractor in Iraq. But before the boom of contractors in the Middle East, Johan was already in the contracting game, working as a guard for the president of Haiti. When the contract ended, he and many of his colleagues got jobs in Iraq. And it was an adventure from the very start. We'll let Johan take it from here. So I arrived in Iraq in April 2004. By the time I got there, there was already a couple of South Africans killed and, and a few uh, Americans and British uh, private military contractors. I still remember I wrote a letter to my family and I said, I'm moving from Haiti to uh, Iraq. And it is dangerous. There are people dying and there are people getting wounded. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm a professional soldier. I was all my life first in the military and then in the private sector, but you, you remain a soldier. And my family understood it, although, you know, my mother and your sister and everybody is a little bit sad and, um, you know, people cry and, and so on and so forth. Uh, at the end of the day, they accepted the fact that this is what I wanted to do. And I went over there and, and I was there for only 10 days and I got, were in the thick of things already. But we were sent on a reconnaissance mission south of Baghdad in an area called the Death Triangle um, for no uh, other reason than it was a place where a lot of people died. It was a very dangerous area. Um, there was a power station that had to be revamped and expanded and a portion of it had to be rebuilt. Um, it was a, a Corps of Engineer, a USA's uh, contract, as far as I can remember. And our team had to go and do a reconnaissance on the area of where this power station was going to be established because we had to go and build a camp there. And then we had to receive the engineers from Texas, from America, that was going to do the footwork and start with the engineering works for the power station. And on the way there, we got ambushed by a bunch of uh, insurgents. And, um, you know, early on in Iraq, we didn't have armored vehicles. We all drove around in normal, we call it soft skin vehicles. So between the two cars, we had a Pajero and a BMW. We took around 40 AK-47 shots through the car. One driver got shot through both arms. Um, the medic got uh, hit in the head, but it was he was fortunate. He was just glanced. I took around to the chest, but fortunately I had bullet, uh, you know, I had PPE on me, so um, I had plates in my in my bulletproof jacket, and that stopped the round. So we got warmed up properly. Um, uh, we had to seek medical attention and evacuation and so on. And then I realized, um, you know, there in in that ambush, um, it was a rolling box ambush, as we call it. It was vehicles moving on the freeway south of Baghdad. And they pulled in between us and next to us and they opened fire, for, you know, from their vehicles. So we were close up with them. And I saw something there that day that I haven't seen before in Africa or in other conflicts or war zones that I've been. And I saw you know, the eyes of my attacker. And and that really captured me and it fascinated me that I could see somebody of so much hate and bloodlust and conviction in his eyes determined to kill you as a foreigner. And I realized that this is a different ball game. These people have a different mindset that's attacking us. And then I started studying the terrorist organizations in the Middle East and their ideologies and, you know, why are they so militant? But what I realized is that, you know, you need to know exactly who your enemy is because they were they, they came from all sides. It, it was kids um, that was coaxed into throwing grenades at the American forces and the contractors. Eventually, in 2005, there were women that dressed up in, you know, uh, as suicide bombers and, and women couldn't be searched at the checkpoints and stuff at the time. So that was, uh, you know, you, you had to keep your eye on the ball all the time. And there were so many different insurgency groups. It was not one group only. It wasn't only Al-Qaeda in Iraq or, or uh, anybody else. So 
I studied it very uh, attentively and, and, you know, I, I made it my business to find out what is going on. And from there, yeah, I moved around into very many different dangerous areas. We got suicide bombed, we got rocketed, mortared, ambushed. Um, a lot of people died around me. I was fortunate on a few occasions. But initially, everybody was caught off guard with the level of violence, the type of bombs that they built, you know, the beheadings, the the cruelty to their own people. It 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 it, it could get overwhelming at times if you were not properly uh, conditioned, mentally conditioned. It 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 could overwhelm you. But um, it was in the early days, you know, two thousand and four, five, six, seven. Those were the dangerous years in Iraq. And from a South African perspective. Um, the first South African was killed in January 2004, and there were 38 South Africans that were killed working as private military contractors from 2004 until 2010. And these stats only came out now when I researched my book. They were not really accurate numbers anyway reflected because a lot of families wanted to keep it quiet and, you know, we were not really supposed to be there and the government, our government tried to stop the guys from working overseas in conflict zones and so on and so forth. So the truth came out of the book. But um, double that amount got seriously wounded and maimed and injured and killed. And that's why I called my book Blood Money. Um, I knew it would draw attention and people would say, yeah, look, yeah, it's a bunch of mercenaries going to kill people for money. But it is not. It is in the execution of our protective duties, working for mostly American security companies on uh, United States government contracts. We bled the same as what the soldiers did and, and what the other coalition forces did. So there was no distinction between a private military contractor or a U.S. serviceman or a British serviceman. If you were a foreigner and you had to do with, with the reconstruction process of Iraq, you were a target. When we come back, a new contracting job spells misfortune for Johan, which changes his life forever. Stay informed on all the news that matters most to the military community with a subscription to Stars and Stripes Digital Access. As a subscriber, you'll enjoy unlimited access to the Stripes.com website and our Stars and Stripes mobile apps, updated 24-7 by reporters stationed at military bases around the globe. Subscribe today and enter the promo code PODCAST when signing up for a yearly subscription and receive 50% off your first year. Get exclusive access to special features, interactive articles, award-winning photography, and more. Visit stripes.com slash digital and enter the promo code podcast to subscribe today. Well, up until this date, the, the only maritime work that was done by security um, teams was my last project in Iraq. It ran from 2013 to 2017. And that was the construction of a, a breakwater line um, for a new deep sea port because right at the tip of Iraq there's a little village called Al Fau. So the first phase of this contract was won by a Greek construction company to build the 8,000 meter, 8 kilometer breakwater line. Um, into the Persian Gulf and then the other one, the Western Breakwater Line is still under construction. That's a 14,000 or 14 kilometer breakwater line on the Kuwait side. So they had like barges and they had cranes and stuff on boats. They had construction boats out on the Persian Gulf and these boats needed protection. So, you know, it was a challenge for me. Nobody knew how to put boats on the, on, on the Persian Gulf in, in Iraqi territorial waters. Um, they didn't have a coast guard, their navy didn't have a clue. They didn't even have boats at the time, much of a navy. So, you know, it was a new system that I had to get approved because um, everything you do in Iraq has to be approved by the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Defense, and then, you know, the Navy got involved. And, and you know, by then, in 2013, the U.S. forces has withdrawn and handed power over to the Iraqis. I had to create the procedure and everybody wanted to make money because they were very corrupt. Um, 
and yeah it was a headache but i managed to to get it going and yeah we we got like inflatables um rigid old boats with with strong engines on them and we put security guards on there with with uh, assault rifles and we patrolled day and night we had to be because the construction crews that built the breakwater line worked a 24-hour shift they had day shift and night shift crews working underwater and above water so we had to have our maritime patrol boats there uh, between the um, maritime construction assets so it was a challenge it was an interesting uh, exercise then you know we were there for a little while there's a lot of piracy going on there in the Persian Gulf because there's a lot of smuggling between Iran and Iraq and Saudi and Kuwait and those places the smugglers they smuggle diesel and they smuggle fuel they smuggle firearms and vehicles and then now my guys were there um, patrolling the Iraq territorial waters and uh, yeah we got shot at once or twice um, by by pirates driving by taking shots at our guys that shot back at them the project it was of high value it was close to 300 million dollars and all your procurement now had to occur through Iraqi companies that had to bring the materials in again your life support um, and and everything else that you need to build your camp and there was a lot of corruption and there were crime syndicate so there was a crime racket going on they were stealing a lot of stuff from this construction company and you know any project in Iraq especially in the later years you had to appoint Iraqis to work for you to go and do the procurement in town and to speak the language and you, we couldn't drive cars ourselves in Iraq in later years you had to have an Iraqi driver and of course you want to give some upliftment to the community and the local village and jobs and so on and so forth but unfortunately a large element of that was from a tribe that um, decided to steal a lot and to enrich themselves from this project instead of uplifting their community. And so when we started putting the patrols out there and roadblocks on land and, and maritime patrols on sea, they couldn't smuggle diesels, particularly diesel fuel that they siphoned off the construction um, uh, maritime craft and off the tugboats and so on because the, the smuggling of diesel fuel in in Iraq and in the Middle East is a big business. Um, they, they, they dilute it and they sell it for cheap and, um, you know, it's a real big problem. So I was hampering progress, my security team and I, with my security plans. So they devised a plan. They went to the local magistrate and the local colonel that was in on the theft racket, uh, part of the syndicate, and they got a proper warrant of arrest signed by a magistrate for my arrest. So, you know, I, I woke up one... Friday morning early, um, my little uh, caravan uh, was surrounded by a bunch of border police guys in machine guns, and they raided my room, and they went through all my stuff, and they said that uh, I'm a terrorist. Now, that was in 2014. That was a month after ISIS invaded northern Iraq. You know, uh, ISIS announced themselves to the world the 10th of June 2014 when they invaded Iraq from Syria, um, from Raqqa and they took over Mosul, the second largest city. They got hold of half a billion dollars in cash and another half a billion dollars in gold. So overnight, they were the richest terrorist organization in the world. So a month later, the the, the theft syndicate, because then, um, you know, they declared the caliphate from Raqqa to Mosul, and there was a lot of foreign fighters from all over the world joining ISIS. There was up to 30,000 foreigners from all sorts of places in the world, including the US and the UK and the France and, and places like that that went to join ISIS. So there was a lot of foreigners that came uh, to join the ranks of ISIS and they used this as an excuse. They said that I was a foreigner and you know that I am aiding ISIS. So they had the whole thing worked out because all of Iraq was paranoid about foreigners at that time. Anybody that, but I mean, we've been working in the country for a decade already. They knew us, they knew our movements, they knew they could track our visas, they could see we worked for the US military on US military contracts and so on and so forth. But anyway, I was accused to be a terrorist, so um, the magistrate signed it and a general signed off on it. And of course, they all crooks, they all get money from, from the theft syndicate that wanted to take me out of play so that I can stop hampering the smuggling process. So I was taken to the border patrol police station where I spent many hours being interrogated. And then they moved me to Basra to a prison where I was in a prison cell, a large prison cell under very 
hectic conditions with seven um, IC suspects because by then they were handing up people left, right and centre because ISIS was then really, um, you know, giving it to them up in the north. And of course the Iraqis abused it, you know, they, if they didn't like their neighbour or they didn't like their employer or they didn't like the way they got spoken to, they point a finger and say, hey, this guy is ISIS. It, it, it. And, and, and I mean, people had to look into it, the police and the military had to look into it. So. A lot of people got rounded up unnecessarily. But I was in a cell with seven IC suspects. I was only there for two days. Now, the plan I found out afterwards was to hang me because they hang people every week in Iraq on Article 4 of terrorism. And that was the, that's a very serious charge. If you get charged with terrorism and they can find you guilty there and then they can hang you. And so I found out that that was the plan, to find me guilty in a very short space of time and to hang me, to take me out of play. But luckily, when I went down to Basra, when I got this project going and I had the maritime approvals going and so on and so forth, I also met with a lot of generals and colonels and one can ascertain who's the good ones and who's the bad ones. So I made friends with the good ones. Luckily, when I was in jail, um, I could fall back on some of the generals in Basra that knew me, that knew that I worked in Iraq for over a decade. They knew the project and they knew it was legitimate. They helped us with all our approvals with our firearms and our movement orders and everything. So they got me out there, actually. Um, you know, so I'm glad I did that kind of breach work when I got there and befriended these generals because if I stayed in that jail a little bit longer, they would have found me guilty sooner, rather sooner than later, and I could have been hung. Yeah, I got out and in jail those two days there, I got very sick. I was poisoned. The food that they gave me was poisoned. And I also picked up a viral infection in my brain. It was, it was unsanitary conditions like you can't believe it. It was really, it was a, it was a hellhole. And um, so I had to be flown back to South Africa. I was very sick. I almost kicked the bucket and they had to do surgery on me to release pressure on my brain um, from the uh, viral infection that I picked up there from the unsanitary conditions and also the after effects of the poisons that they put in my food. Um, I survived it, but it, 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 it was an interesting curve, you know. In the old days, we were looking out for rockets, mortars, IED, suicide bombers. But in the latter years in Iraq, you had to look out for the enemy within. So you continued working until late 2017. Did you not, was there not part of you that said, screw this? I got injured in Iraq with that shootout, that first um, shootout that I explained when I was there for 10 days and we went on the recon mission. Um, I broke my shoulder badly in that contact and my arm, my left arm was partially um, disabled. I couldn't use my left arm much, but I didn't want to leave Iraq. I didn't want to leave. So we didn't want to leave our jobs, scared that you might not come back and somebody else take it. So I worked for three years in, in Iraq from 2004 to seven with a broken shoulder um, that hurt like hell. And, you know, I almost got addicted to some very serious painkillers. But then, uh, you know, I left Iraq in 2007 for a while. I did contracting work in Africa and I had my shoulder fixed up. It took quite a while, serious surgery, reconstructive. And then when I got sick in jail, now because it's not a physical scar, it was a virus, it was poison, it's stuff you can't see. And, you know, I came to South Africa, I was diagnosed with this and that and the next, and they said they had to intervene and do surgery on me to release the pressure on my brain. I had it done. But I also decided to go straight back. I know there were conspiracies and there were plans to come after me again, but they didn't. So, you know, it's like falling off a horse. When you get off, you have to get back in there and you have to ride that horse. Otherwise, you're scared of that horse for life. And it worked. Um, they saw after a while that they are not going to run us over. They're not going to run us out of town. And, and the company started seeing less um, losses. Um, and, 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 you know, they turned their attention to other projects in the area that kicked off and they went there and they raided those projects. So... In a way, it was the right thing to do, but, you know, my family and my uh, neurologist and my my home doctor and everybody was very unhappy that I made the decision, but it was something that had to be done, you know, otherwise they won, they, they chase you away, they, they get you arrested, they scare you off and then you run away, so no, I had to go back. 
my body has taken a lot of punishment from my military days. I've had many surgeries, reconstructive and otherwise. But one of the main reasons that I left Iraq is uh, they had to build a shunt into my body that drains my brain now on a permanent basis. You know, I've got a pipe running from my spine into my stomach. It was serious surgery and um, there's, there's silicone piping in me. And as I'm talking to you here now, there's 18 milliliters of brain fluid draining from my brain into my stomach. And that's a condition for life. Once I had that viral infection and, and it messes with the fluids in your brain, they have to keep these things in for life. So the project finished and I was called to back that. And there was a position to be a PSD team leader and and to work on PSD security and so on and so forth. So I gave it a try for a month. But the problem is now I couldn't wear body armor. So, you know, because it's got uh, it's got metal plating in it and it's tight fitting. And because I've got a small three millimeter silicon pipe in me, that's that started affecting uh, the, the drainage from my brain. So I had the buildup of fluid in my brain again because I had to wear body armor on a daily basis where as a project manager in the self, I didn't I wasn't really required to. But um, and 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 I thought I was going to die. I, you know, my one eye went blind and I had headaches from hell. It feels like your head wants to explode because you've got too much pressure on your brain. And I said, you know, I've been around a long, long time. Maybe it is time to call it a day. Um, medically, uh, I'm, I'm injured. Um, I've, I've got a shunt in me. I've got pipes in me. I've got stuff that's not really friendly towards that kind of lifestyle. And, and I called it today. And I, you know, um, I started writing my book when I was there as a memoir uh, for, for my generations to follow, to know what we've done, because nobody's ever written about it. So I decided to come home to complete my book. Um, and then, yeah, to, to see what, what direction my life want to take uh, from there. But, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it was injury driven mostly. But it was also time. I've been contemplating it for a while after that big project. And, you know, after I did some good work in Baghdad, I, I was thinking of calling it today because, you know, 20 years on the road, um, you don't have much of a family life. You know, my father passed away while I was in Iraq and I left home when I was 17. I never returned. I only saw my parents once or twice a year, maybe a Christmas day year or a day there. And I wanted to spend time with my folks, but unfortunately that didn't pan out. Uh, my, my dad died while the book was written and my mom is still alive and you know now I am spending more time with my family and with old friends and catching up, up on stuff that went by you for the last 33 years being a soldier and a private military contractor. Thanks to Johan Roth for talking with us for this episode. To hear more, you can check out his book Blood Money, Stories of an ex recce's Missions as a Private Military Contractor in Iraq. In the next episode, we hear from Kimberly Motley, the first foreigner to litigate in the Afghan courts, and how she fights for the private contractors who get caught in a corrupt system. Oh, I go to the judges, I said, how could you have found him guilty of this? And he didn't do this. And the judges looked at me and they were confused and they said, we gave him the minimum. And I'm like, what? Because the minimum was two years. And I told the judge, I said, the minimum is not guilty. And so, Later, I was to find out that in this court, no one had ever been found not guilty. Don't forget to subscribe. And while you're there, leave us a review. You can also let us know your thoughts at podcast at stripes.com. Also, follow us on Twitter for updates at Stars and Stripes. Force for Hire's supervising editors are Bob Reed and Terry Leonard. Digital team lead and editor is Michael Darnell. Thanks for listening. This, this is, is Force for, for Hire. hire.